Uh, sorry for that we don't have the time break, but this is the last talk. And I thank you very, uh, very much for staying with us to finish this last presentation. You are a really good audience. Uh, so in this topic, uh, I will you know, discuss something that is not that conventional because we will talk about the game, actually two games that are developed in our China project. But I will try to be very serious in discussing it and hopefully even persuade some of you to try out this game by the end of this talk. The content of this uh, presentation is organized into four parts. First, I will touch the background regarding to the concept of the series games, and then the design and the implementation uh, made by our project. And we have actually two versions. The first one is a board game. Then we have another one that is a digital application. Then I will briefly uh, show you some examples regarding how to apply this kind of series game in the um, you know, awareness building and also some uh, research purpose like the analysis and policy test. And then I will make my final remark and conclude. Okay, so background. Now to begin with, I want to give you three seconds to think about the similarity and the difference between the managing a reservoir and the managing an aquifer. So three, two, one. Okay, time is over. So they both represent a massive water storage. But how to regulate the water use are very different between the two. As you see here, for the reservoir, the water is held back by a dam. And by opening the sluice gate, one can control the water release. Instead, for the aquifer, the water is stored in the porous media like a sponge. So we have to extract it out by digging wells and pumping. And moreover, a reservoir can be easily controlled by a few people sitting in a control room operating this uh, sluice gate on a computer but for an aquifer, there can easily be hundreds of wells. They like, these wells are like, uh, you know, micro sluice gates, but uh, they are owned by different users. And each user thinks they are legitimate to use groundwater. So to manage the aquifer, you have to actually manage the pumping by those heter heterogeneous users. And in our case, in Guantao County, which has an arable land of about, uh, I think, 320 square kilometers, there are more than 7,000 wells in use. And roughly that is uh, 22 wells per each square kilometer. So to manage the groundwater storage, the, um, the governors have to introduce different rules to regulate pumping. And those rules are referred as policies. Those policy can be uh, strict or gentle. A typical taxonomy put those policies into three categories, namely sticks or carrot or the sermons. So a stick type policy force people to follow the rules. So they constrain the degree of the freedom of the people, such as the example, such as licensing of the water use. Then the correct type of the policy give the reward or punishment in order to drive the behavior towards a desired one. Now for the last sermon type policy, we distribute information to stakeholders without imposing any constraints on them. Although those informations might or might not change their behavior. And some common uh, sermon type policy uh, includes the use of the brochure or the campaign. But recently there are more and more research focusing on the use of a new concept called the series games as a sermon tools. So, okay, at this point, I think some of you might already be wondering, are you serious? How can we, uh, how can a game be serious? So your complaints are well received, but uh, I have to tell you that the, the fact that there is a long history in studying this concept of the series games. For example, in, this, uh, in the book called the series games published, uh, written by this author called the Clark Abt, he expressed, he expressed these uh, definitions regarding the, to the games that have an explicit and a carefully uh, sought out educational purpose rather than amusement. This is the very first version of the definition of the series game. And since then, a more general definition for series games refer to games that are used for serious purposes, such as education, you know, healthcare, morality building, et cetera. Another classical example for this uh, series game use is this Lord game, which is invented by um, a researcher called uh, Dr. Lisa Maji in 1906. She used this game to de demonstrate the effect of land concentration to public who might not, 
uh, have difficulties in comprehending the theory themselves. Later, this game comes with a lot of variations, one of which is even very popular nowadays. And I think you already know uh, which it is, and it's a Monopoly game. So I hope for now you uh, start to feeling a little bit more comfortable about the series games. So one of the typical use of this series game for, is for this uh, so-called uh, edutainment, that is to infuse the knowledge into the gameplay. And then you pass the knowledge to the players when they are playing the game. This is called the learning by playing. And because the games are supposed to be interesting and immersive, this learning process via series game is also expected to be smoother compared to traditional you know, class-based approaches. And now we are in the digital era with the development of the computer technology. Those modern games can be presented in a more vivid and dynamic manners, particularly that now we can embed the computer simulation models in the game. For example, in this uh, famous digital game, SimCity, there are a lot of models inside to describe the weather, the traffic, the landscape changes, and et cetera. So, Models are used to conceptualize the physical processes in real world. And we researchers use models to do simulation analysis, and then we learn the knowledge, right? Now, by coupling these kind of simulators or models with the game, we let our stakeholders as player to be part of the simulation and to learn what can happen as they interact with the virtual environment described by the models in the game. And in this sense, we use a series game as a laboratory. So in another paper published in 2007, the author, this author very, um, made a very nice summary about six functional use of the series games for the natural resource management. The first one is game used as a laboratory, which I just showed you. And then the game can also be used as a design studio so people can you know, brainstorm new ideas about the manage management strategy in the game. Then the game can also use as a pra practice ring. It means uh, you bring the decision maker into the game, then let the decision maker to propose a policy and implement it in the game and see what will happen or what is the response uh, from the players as if the players are the stakeholders. Then the game can also be used as a negotiation table. But in this case, because the game is, you know, create a very relaxed uh, atmosphere so people have a safer environment to discuss the critical issues. And the game can also be used as a consultative forum. So it's uh, like a round table discussion. People can uh, express freely in the game. Then the, the, the last use of the game is to use it as a parliament. So in this case, people can use the game to uh, demonstrate some ideas or, or to clarify some arguments. So those are the six functions of the serial scheme in the policy context proposed by this uh, person. And in the literature, there are already a number of the serial scheme applications in the water resource management. For example, in this uh, paper published in 2016, they made this virtual river serial scheme. It is used to exploring the management strategy for river and the flood plain management. Then this one, this guy also made another serious game for the urban water planning. And this one is for the flood mitigations. Then this last one <coughs> is applied for the Mekong River region where they also use a game to raise awareness for the collaboration for the transboundary river management. And then also to use a game to upgrade the manager's knowledge so in our project, we contribute another series game. And this game is based on the context of the Guantao pilot. So as you've seen before, many characteristics of the Guantao County can be found in, many, uh, in other places in the North China Plain where the overpumping problem exists. In, <clears throat> in Guantao, we know that the most of the region uh, are used for agriculture, for agriculture and the climate is semi-arid. So <clears throat> the main irrigation water uh, source is the groundwater particularly the shallow groundwater pumping. And the decline on the groundwater table is mostly caused by this double cropping practice. practice. So they grow two crops in a year, but the annual rainfall can only uh, support you know, uh, one crops like summer mice. 
So the additional crop water demand has to be satisfied via the irrigation from the groundwater. Then there is this typical conflict, actually, um, it's uh, over, in, over the China. That's a conflict between the green self-sufficiency and also uh, under these groundwater protections. So on one hand, we want to have a lot of green protection to be sure that we are self-sufficient, but uh, to, or we also want to protect the environment. So it's really a trade-off issue. So with this game, our goal is to uh, use a game to educate the local farmers about the sustainable use of the groundwater, uh, groundwater resources, which might be a difficult concept uh, for the farmers if we did directly teach them, because those farmers are usually old and they do not have very high educational level. Then we have also some innovative ideas about, to, uh, about using the game. So we want to use the game to test the different policies and their effects. And we also want to use the games to study farmers' behavior patterns, as I said before. So game as a laboratory. <clears throat> now, let me show you how the, uh, the game are implemented and how uh, one can play it. So you can have a better understanding of the mechanisms. And I hope it will also uh, have your attention on this game. So the game is called, excuse me. The game is called Save the Water, and we have made two versions during our projects. So the first is this board game, and then later on we made a digital one. And in the following slides, I will explain their main features respectively starting from this board game. So the board game uh, has three main features. So the first feature is that this game is a strategic game for four players. It's very like a monopoly game and this game is coupled with a conceptual agronomic model based on Guantao's agricultural practice. And then all those materials, so those game artifacts are mainly based on the cardboards. So it's very easy to produce. Actually, we also include this link where you can download the templates and you can print it out by yourself and cut it into pieces. There are, there are full instructions. You, know, you can also find the, the manuscript, uh, the instruction files that teach you the, how you organize the game plays. And in this game, the general rules are that first each player play, uh, will play as a farmer. Then we need a, a game master to guide the game. Then the goal of this game is that, is, uh, is that first as a group, we want to avoid the over groundwater depletions. Then as individual players, uh, each one, each player should try to beat the others by earning more money as much as possible. Then the game will end if the maximum uh, rounds, so the maximum years are finished. And in this board game, the maximum years are four. And another uh, criterion that uh, for the termination of the game is that if the last water from this groundwater pool is removed, then everyone loses. So it's like uh, um, this, um, uh, common resource problem. Then the main artifacts are composed by different cards and each card has uh, their own specific use. For example, for this character card, each player will have one character card. And on this uh, character card, there are uh, some equipment that you can acquire during the game and then you can use it throughout the games. And these equipment includes the big water pump, the, insur the agriculture insurance, and the water tank. And each equipment comes with so, some cost. And it's, this cost is indicated by the silver icon. So minus four means you have to pay four coins to get this. And then the effect of each equipment is written just below this uh, title. So you can read it and understand what, how to use it. Apart from the character card, you have the uh, multiple field cards that you can buy as your farmlands. And on these field cards, on the top is the indication for the price uh, to buy this new land. So in this case, each land costs five coins. Then there's also the cost to maintain this land. And this is indicated by this circular icons. And for the land, it's two coins. In the middle part is the plot where you can plant uh, you know, virtually plant your crops on your uh, field. And the, we include the three types of crops that are represented the main crops in Guantao. The first is a single cropping, then 
the second case, the second one is the double cropping, then the vegetables. And the player can choose only one of the three per each field. Right. So each, uh, each crop comes with a cost for the seed, and this is indicated here. And moreover, each crop comes with uh, the different yields and the different intensity of, of, of irrigations. So those icon of the water droplet indicates uh, the amount of irrigation. For example, for the single crop, the maximum irrigation intensity is three drop of the water, and it produces eight coins as the income. <coughs> Instead, you can also irrigate two coins at two drops of the water. This will give you slightly less incomes. The reason why we have this uh, two levels of the production is that we want to reproduce this typical nonlinear crop, crop water productivity function. So as you see, this functions uh, usually looks like this. So you have the increasing crop yield when with the increasing irrigation water use, and then it will go down again. But um, you will reach a maximum values uh, here under a certain amount of the irrigation water use. But if you if you divide this crop yield by the irrigation water use, then you get the water productivity. And if you compare the water productivity between the point A and the point B, you will actually find that the point A is more water uh, productive. So it's more efficient in terms of the irrigation. And that's why in the literature, many people propose this so-called deficit irrigation as a way to save the water. Then on the bottom are the uh, equipments that you can buy. Uh, They're similar to like the one that you see in the character card, but in this case, those equipments only apply on each field. So these effect, uh, these equipments can either uh, helps you to um, boost your productivity and but this productivity benefit only applies for each field. So if you have second field, then you have to buy additional equipments for that field as well. And in this case, we have three type of the field-based equipment, such as the greenhouse, which is required if you want to grow vegetables. <clears throat> we have the tractors, which you can get, can give you additional incomes during the harvest for single and double crop. Then you can have also the sprinklers, which help you to reduce irrigations on this field. <clears throat> then we have this uh, so-called groundwater table card. In this card, uh, we use this grid mesh to represent the groundwater storage. Each grid is a unit of the storage. At the beginning of the game, we will put a several amount of the water droplets at the initial groundwater level. And this water will decrease from the top to bottom. And then this different color indicates different level of the criticality of the groundwater levels. <clears throat> the groundwater will be consumed during the game when the farmers, when the players are uh, irrigating. So they take the water out from this uh, groundwater pool. And then whenever they enter into lower groundwater levels, uh, then they have to pay additional money as the um, effect of the drilling of the new wells. Then the groundwater uh, table can be refilled via the rainfall recharge in the game. So. In this, case, in this case, the recharge will bring the water uh, from bottom to top. But also you can expand the capacity of your groundwater when you buy new fields. But this does not mean that your, um, the, groundwater tape, uh, the groundwater storage, is, the aquifer is physically expanding, but it just means when you buy new land, you, have, you can gain new access to the groundwater storage beneath your ground. And during the pumpings, there can be some negative events uh, that which can be triggered. And this uh, triggering of the negative events depending on the rolling dice. So the dice is used as kind of random number generator. And then it all, the probability of this negative events occurrence also depends on the critical level of the groundwater. So the lower the groundwater table is, the more likely that you will trigger some negative events, just like the reality. Then the last uh, game artifact is this game card, the main game card board. So on this board, uh, the, the game master or the players use it to chase the progress of the game. And uh, as I said before, in this board game, we have four years as the maximum game runs. 
and each year is composed by nine phases indicated by those circles. And we start from the weather forecast, which tell you what the weather could look like this year, but this is not 100% accurate. So there is some uncertainty. Then given the forecast, the players can start to invest their lands by buying fields, buying equipment, crops, and also uh, to acquire some equipment equipments under their character card. Then the real weather will be reviewed, which could be different from the forecast, as I said before, due to this uncertainty. And then different weather will recharge the groundwater aquifer differently. So the wet year will recharge the most, then the dry year will recharge the least. And this uh, actual weather is revealed by just flipping this weather card. Then after the uh, actual weather being shown, and we are entering the irrigation phase. So the, the, during the irrigation phase, the player have to irrigate the crops. And that during the irrigation, uh, each player uh, will take the water from the groundwater pool cards and in a rotational uh, fashion. So one after, each, one after another. And then we comes with this harvest phase where people will get the money according to their uh, crop chosen. And then also depends on the equipment, you will get some additional benefit. Then we have the upkeep phase to uh, pay the money for the maintenance of your land and the maintenance of your equipment. And in phase seven, we have a phase called the console. So in this case, players are allowed to uh, brainstorm or briefing some ideas or what kind of policy they want to implement themselves so, so as to uh, constrain uh, the players. So in this case, they can formulate the policy by choosing one that are defined from our policy cards, or they can create their own, uh, their own ones. And uh, if everyone agrees on the policy, then the policy will take effect after uh, starting from the next year. And, but it does not mean the policy will be persistent. They can remove it whenever they want, as long as they all agree. And this kind of policy briefing is actually use the feature of this series game as a design studio. So people can think about some new strategies that might not uh, uh, exist before. And then we have the phase eight. And in phase eight, we have some random events to give the games more intriguing uh, uh, take, taste, let's say. And these events, some events will give you additional benefit, like the grant. Some uh, events will give you um, some um, privilege uh, that you can use this, uh, the card, the event card later on to avoid some negative events or, um, you know, to make, uh, to introduce some funny things during the game. Then in phase nine, we enter the new year, which will bring the games into the second, the next years. So this will just repeat until the uh, termination criterion is met. Now let's come to the second version, which is this uh, digital games. And the, this digital games is completely web-based and uh, you can play it on your uh, smart device. So your um, cell phone or your PC, as long as you have the browsers, actually you can open this game link on your self, uh, on, your, uh, on your phone, if you have it with you, and then you can play it while you are listening to my presentations. So in the following slides, I will in, again, uh, el elaborate the features of this uh, digital games and explain how it works. But the main uh, workflow is very similar to the board games. This is the game interface that you see when you log in this game. And on this uh, top, uh, right corner, we have some indicators for the progress of the games. This one tells you the, the stage of the gameplay. And this denominator 15 means is the total number of the year is 15 years to be played. And now you are in the first year, which is this denominator. And the current weather is sun, a sunny day, which is indicated by the icon here. And then uh, this uh, this number 70 means the total capital you have accumulated so far. So that's the amount of money that's in your pocket. And this is this minus icon means the maintenance cost for this for this year. And then the last one is this the groundwater 
level indicators. So again, the denominator tell you the capacity of the groundwater that you can use. And then the denominator 11 means the current groundwater level. And uh, in the middle part is the, your farmland. And the below the farmland, this large groundwater pool is our groundwater reserve, which is visible to players. But in, of course, in reality, we cannot see the groundwater directly. Then your mainland is uh, just a, above this groundwater pool. So this piece of the tiles is your farmland. Then those transparent one are the farmland that you can buy, but it's not yet owned by, by, by you. Now on the top left corner are the equipments that can be purchased during the game. And again, we have uh, um, several equipments available. So we have the greenhouse, which can be used to, uh, to plant vegetable. Then we have the water saving irrigation to save the amount of water uh, irrigation requ required by the crop. Then we have the tractors to boost the, to boost the productivity. And on the, if you remember in, uh, in the board games, we have this, uh, you know, wheel, the game main boards with a number of faces. And the, in this digital version, we also have a similar mechanism, but it's uh, more compact. It's indicated at the bottom right corner. So current stage is indicate, indicated here. And we have seven, seven faces in total instead of nine. The first phase is the weather forecast which is the same as the board game. And then we have this sowing stage where the players can do several things. First, they can buy crop. And again, in the digital version, uh, version we have three crops, single, double, and vegetables. Each crop comes with two levels of productivity. And uh, for the vegetables, we also introduce some kind of random number to reflect the, you know, the market phenomenon, the fluctuation of the uh, vegetable price in the market. Then to, uh, the players can also buy the new fields during this sowing stage. To buy a new field, you just click those transparent tile and then the, the, uh, your pocket money will be deduced and then the new land will become available for you to grow. You can also buy the equipment and to buy the equipment, just drag those icons to your land where you want the equipment to be installed and that's it. You can also sell stuff. If you don't want the equipment anymore, you can uh, click on the, the icon of all this equipment or the lens, then there is an option that you can sell it with a half price. After the, after the sewing stage, then the, uh, the real weather will be reduced. So it's the same as the board game. So I'll just skip. Then after the, the real weather, we enter into the irrigation stage. Again, for the irrigations, we can do full irrigation or deficit irrigations. And to do the irrigations, you just click your mouse on the groundwater pool. And then you will see that there is a, you know, this kind of water drop icons on the top of the crop that indicating the crop water demand. So when you click this uh, crop icon again uh, once, then one drop of the water will be filled. So you are irrigating this crop. And then once, uh, you irrigate to a suf sufficient amount of the water, you will see that your land turned into yellow, which means now you can have harvest. And uh, there is also another thing that you noticed here is this bar. This bar tell you the amount of water you have used for, for the irrigation in this year. And uh, you can also define some water quota, so some caps, which is indicated by this red triangular. So in some cases, we can implement the policy in the game this is also a new feature in this digital version. I will talk it later. But in this case, we introduce a policy that if the water is used below the quota, then you get some benefit. If you're above the quota, you can get some, uh, <clears throat> you will um, have some punishment, some tax. So this is indicated by the icons here. And also if uh, you irrigate too much, then you will see the groundwater is gradually depleting and then when it's depleting too much, the groundwater table will turn into different color. So yellow means critical, and it can also turn into red, which is even more critical. And if you are in the critical levels, you have to pay additional monies uh, for the pumping. And this amount, additional money represents the additional energy cost. 
uh, the last but not least is this uh, random events that are we also incorporated in this digital version. For example, we have some random thunder strike that can broke, broke, uh, break your equipment. So you have to repair it in order to have it working again. You have, we also have the past damage. And uh, remember, uh, one big difference is that in this uh, digital version, it's a single player game instead of the multiple player games, which is of course, uh, <clears throat> kind of intuitive for the reality since the groundwater represents a common resource. But we do have a uh, mechanism that uh, mimicking the collective water use. So there is events called neighboring water use. So sometimes you will see that the neighbor is stolen the water from you, uh, or sometimes they can contribute to the water uh, to your uh, to the groundwater table in your case. And this probability and and the, the type of the events depends on the water use uh, during your gameplays. So they are associated. Then if you look at the lower bottom. The lower bottom left corners, there's a number called the game sessions. This number is used to retrieve the individual game results because this is a digital application. All the data is uploaded into the server. And then from the server, you can download the, uh, the results for the game and to do the analysis later on. That's why I said before, we wanted to use this game for some uh, analysis. And with this kind of data retrieval functions, we can achieve that. Now, be, uh, apart from this uh, game interface, we also have a backend platform. This backend platform is for the researchers who want, who want to manipulate the game and get the results. So on this platform, you will see there are a number of options. And there are options that you can customize the game. So this game is not fixed. You can change the game setting by modifying the price for your crop or make changing the probability of some events. They can, you can also introduce some policies. You can divide, define the rules like the quota that I mentioned. You can also introduce you know, some uh, changing of the water price depending, depending on player's behavior. So it's really dynamic. And also you can download the data because all the data is, in, uh, is real time transferred. So you can get it to your local uh, PC to do the analysis with your own uh, scripts later on. And the, with these customizations, the users can combine the uh, customize the game and uh, customize the policy to create a research sessions. And the, this research session has its uh, unique link. This link you can set as, you can distribute to the players. So the players who receive this link will play the game that are customized by you. So it's like the uh, experiment. Wise. And then all the data are uploaded to the server, which can be downloaded as the JSON outputs to perform the analysis later on. Now to sum up, both the board game and the digital games are based on the Guantaz agriculture context. They are both coupled with the conceptual agronomic model. And the difference is that the board game is a multiplayer one and the all the game artifacts is based on the cardboard and that there is this building a policy briefing of, uh, of options. So players can uh, make a brainstorms to design some new policy. And then for the digital games, this is single player with some mechanisms that are mimicking the collective water use. Then this is an on online application so you can uh, access it from your de uh, smart device. And actually in China, even in rural village, all the farmers have are using this very, uh, the cheap smart device that comes with the browser. So, and also we have this very good uh, uh, 5G network, uh, 4G network coverage. So the network connection is also okay. Then in the digital version, the policy are predefined as a rule. Then you can, you can also customize the game by changing the, set, uh, the, the game parameters and all the data are real time transferred uh, and available for the download. Now I want to, to show some applications of this game in our project. So we, first in 2017, we tested this prototype of the board games. We uh, played the, with the old farmers during our field trip. And those farmers, are, you know, the old farmers with little education. So, so we, our team members took the role as the game master. So yeah. 
those are our uh, team, rule, uh, team members. And the, the, the game master explain the rules. And during this uh, field uh, test, the farmers are very enthusiastic in playing it and have a lot of questions to ask about the game mechanism. So when we answered the questions, we also took this opportunity to explain them the idea about groundwater sustainable use. And also when playing, farmers actually tend to make decisions in a game as if they are really uh, farming in, in, re in re reality. So you often hear that farmers saying, I usually do this in my farm. So you can really get them to talk voluntarily when you play the game with them. We also play the game with the staff from the local water bureau to teach them about the groundwater dynamics, the trade-off between the agriculture and the groundwater protection. Then the last two pictures show that we play the, um, the game with students during our Central Asia workshop. In this case, we use the game as kind of icebreaker to get uh, the students involved in on the topic of the groundwater management and also uh, to get them to familiarize the situation in Guantao and, or in North China Plain. We also use this game for the policy analysis. We test it in our class in ETH campus. In this case, we have students divided into two groups. So one group playing uh, one type of the policy, which is based on the water fee. Then another group playing another type of the policy that you usually find in China, it's quota-based policy. And for each type of policy, we further uh, designed the two variations. So one irrigation with low water fee, and then one irrigation, irrigation with high water fee for this water fee-based policy. And for the quota, we have the fixed quota. Then we have the upfront subsidy, which means you first give some uh, money to farmers as credits for irrigation, but this credits only allows them to use certain amount of water. If you are using more than that, you have to, the players have to pay themselves. Then we extract all the results from this uh, uh, game test, which are stored in our server. The results include different uh, state of the variables in the game, such as you know, the capital, the groundwater levels at each year, the forecast and the real weather. And additionally, we also get the results for these decision variables. So what kind of decision they make in the game, such as those decisions include the crop choice, the water, uh, the irrigation water use, then the field acquisition decisions, the adoption of different equipments. And then more interestingly, those uh, records, those variables are time series records with the length up to the maximum game years that we set up. Then we can, calc based on the results, we can calculate some performance indicators uh, and compare the performance within the same group or between different groups. Um, in this case, this, I, I use this uh, so-called uh, <coughs> parallel coordinate plots. In this parallel coordinate plots, actually this is showing the uh, performance uh, for different indicators as shown for each y-axis. So each y-axis is one indicators. We have the water level, the final water level, the total number of the fields they have, the total money they acquired, this water productivity, and et cetera. And the each line is one result from a player. So we have many lines because we have multiple players. We also distinguish from the baseline game, the one that we played with a, a particular policy. And also we highlight the winner, which is shown in this, uh, uh, blue curves. So you, then you can see that if there is some uh, patterns among all the players and why the player or the winners are doing the best by looking at this kind of plots. For example, in this case, for the fixed quota, this player is doing the best because his uh, single crop ratio is high, but also uh, the, you will see that uh, his uh, irrigation water use is around 1.6 and his water productivity is relatively high. But in this case, the, mm, the total money that this winner gets is not very much, uh, uh, is, not, is not much better than the rest of the players. But in some cases, for example, if you look at the subsidy first policy group, this player is doing much better, but also overall all the players are doing much better. 
And the reason is because with this subsidy, first we give the credits as to the file, to the players, so they can use this money to uh, make some early investment, which will boost their productions later on. So from these results, we gain some insights and about their uh, the player strategy, which might help for our design of the policy in reality. Then we can also use a game for the behavioral analysis. And this, I will show you the real re uh, the results that we did with the farmers. So this is the game survey that we did last year in October. We collaborate with a team from Beijing University. Um, so from Professor Qin Xia Wan's team. And we conduct a survey by using the games. We play the games with farmers in Guantao instead of using the traditional uh, paper-based questionnaires then in this case, uh, we spent two days and we covered all the town shape in Guantao. So there are eight town shapes in Guantao. The total village are 16. And we have the 160 farmers participated in this uh, game survey. And the results are later on uh, extracted for the analysis. Now to perform this behavior analysis, I, would, uh, I want to uh, show you the method that we want to use. And this method is called a decision tree which is actually a classification technique from the machine learning. So the idea of the classification using the decision tree is very simple. You have a sample, which you know which class it belongs to. So here in this example, we have two classes, red or this green dots. Then you know some features that might characterize each samples. So in this case, we have two features denoted as X1 and the X2. And then this uh, space, composed by this feature variable is called the feature space. Then you can put all your samples in this feature space. And what the decision tree is doing is that it's just uh, trying to cut this feature space into subregion in order to have a good separation between different classes. And this process is called uh, supervised learning. And uh, another, uh, one, one reason why we use the decision tree as a method for the behavior analysis here instead of the other classical uh, classification approach is because the decision tree will give you a model that looks like uh, you know, this, kind of tree, this kind of trees, which can be interpreted as the decision making process. And also during the calibration of this decision tree model, the algorithm will generate some sensitivity scores telling you which feature is more important this, is, this kind of sensitivity score is very useful if you have feature more than two. So, and in many cases, we do have features more than two. So now let's come back to the application of this uh, results in our game. So we apply this decision tree classification on the, game, the player's results. In this case, the classes are our decision variables and we have different decision variables, for example, the crop preference which can be discrete, uh, which can be treated as three discrete uh, classes. So single crop, double crop, vegetable. We can also have the, uh, the uh, this adoption of irrigation equipment as classes. So this is a binary class zero or one, which means yes or no. And also we can treat the land acquisition. So buy lands or do not buy new lands as two classes. Then we also have the determining factors. So the factors that might influence in their decisions and those factors are considered as features in our case. And the, those features include, for example, the capital level. So the liquid cash in your pocket, then the groundwater levels, either in absolute term or in relative terms in each year during the gameplay, the weather conditions, the number of different equipments you processed. And also we consider their crop preference in the last year. So if they have some uh, memory about what they did, whether this kind of memory will influence in their decision uh, this year. During the field survey, we use a game uh, to play as a survey tool to play with the farmers. Our procedure is like, uh, is these three steps. First, we have the students to explain the game. Then we make a very short trial test so they can understand what is the general rule. And then we will start the formal plays with the students to supervise the progress. And the similar to the questionnaires, we uh, also have to pay some compensations for occupying their working time. But in this case, 
this uh, the amount of money uh, for, for the compensation links to their game performance. So the higher, the better they play, the more money they will, that they will get. So in this case, we motivate them to finish the game. So in the end, the farmers, uh, most of the farmers are able to complete the game at, mo uh, at least once. And it's more, um, more than 50%, so 67% of farmers actually play the game more than two times. And uh, this, uh, you know, the environment, the atmosphere is quite relaxed compared with this face-to-face -face questionnaire survey. And here is a histogram plot showing the player's prof uh, profiles. For example, um, our player's age, uh, this two model distribution. So uh, it's two typical, uh, it's a typical two generation. First is a uh, middle age around 40. And then we have the old farmers around 55 years old, but we also have very old farmers, farmer players around more than 70 years old. Then the average educational level is around uh, seven to 10 years. So that's between the primary school and the high school in China. And all these players are not some, you know, uh, we, we randomly found some children to play. These are, farm, are real farmers. You see, they have the farming years from 20 years up to 50 years, quite experienced one. And the, at the average farm size that they have is around five mu. And one mu is uh, about six, 167 uh, square meters in China. These profiles actually are very typical example uh, of the general farmer's characteristic in Guantao. And uh, most of these farmers are able to finish the game at least once. And you see that there are also some farmers play um, more than uh, three times, even up to seven times. Once we obtain all these game results played by farmers, we first look at their performance by you know, making this parallel coordinate plot. Then we try to look at the patterns. For example, in this case, uh, farmers do not uh, choose uh, vegetables very often. This amount of uh, ratio of the vegetable crop is uh, clustering around the zero. Because in the game, we found out that farmers, <clears throat> even during the game, they tend to choose what they do in the real world. So they mostly change, choose a single crop and a double crop. And if you look at the water productivity, this value is not very high compared to the one that we observed during the class. It's around 10, sometimes it's even negative. So farmers is not really calculating uh, in terms of the uh, farming business in this case. And the, the winners also is not very uh, distinctive in terms of the performance. Then we applied this classification methods using the decision tree. As I said before, during this uh, calibration of the decision tree model, the algorithm will produce some sensitivity score for feature variables, telling you which feature plays a bigger role in obtaining a good uh, classification. So since now we have this uh, class, which are the decision variable, our features are factors that may affect uh, farmer's uh, decision in the game. This sensitivity actually inform us that which important factor that uh, affect the decision of farmers most in the games. So for example, this is the one result for the decision regarding to the crop preference. This box plot show you the calculated sensitivity score for all these potential feature variables that we collected during the games from the capture level to different equipment that they own. So this X axis is the potential determining factors. The Y axis is the value of the sens sensitivity score. This box plot, uh, uh, this box show you this uh, uncertainty, which is due to our sampling uh, process. But for this results, we just look at the median curve. So as you can see, when we look at the decision regarding to the crop preference, the most important factor is actually the previous crop choice. So what they do in the last year affect a lot in their crop choice this year. It's kind of inertia, which is quite interesting. So this, uh, so they, it, it means that uh, farmers have the habit to do what they do, they used to do. And then after these uh, factors, the second important factor is this groundwater level in percentage. So how, critic, how critical is the groundwater level? Is this might 
this factor might affect their preference as well. We also add, look at the other decision variables. For example, in this case, we look at the uh, irrigation behavior. So under irrigation is defined as the profuse, the water is used by less than three units of water. So uh, if it's less than three units of water, it means the farmers is either growing single crop or they have to buy some irrigation equipment in order to achieve the water consumption less than three. And in this case, the most important factor that affect their under irrigation behavior is the groundwater level, which is also interesting because it really means if you let the farm, if you inform farmers about the how critical your groundwater is, then they can um, the, this this information will motivate farmers motivate farmers to save the waters. And if you let, look at look at another decision variable in this case, which is the adoption of the sprinkler, and the, in this case the capital is the most important factor. So if they have the monies, they will, uh, if they have the monies, this will mostly determine the adoption of the sprinklers. But if this barrier is, uh, is solved, then the second important factor is again the groundwater levels. So in all these cases, we found that the groundwater level actually plays quite an important role in farmers' decisions. So that's why in our project, we try to persuade the local water uh, governors to establish some uh, uh, billboard, uh, the information boards to tell them uh, what the current level is. Actually, we want them to have this uh, LED uh, screen, which can uh, show the groundwater table in real time. But uh, um, uh, for now, they just make this simple post as the first child. And the last, as I said before, the final model that we can get from this decision tree classification is this decision tree model, looks like a tree. And each branch is a decision, uh, is a path for reaching a particular decision. So similar to a rule-based decision-making process. So for example, this branch highlighted by the red curve is uh, one decision rule to achieve the single crop uh, uptake. And we can translate this branch into a thematic rules, which will read like this. So if a groundwater level is less than this amount and this condition, uh, and if the forecast weather is normal or dry, the actual weather is normal or dry, the capital is less than uh, 862 then by single crop. So this kind of model, even though it might not be true for the real decision-making process, give us some clue about the <clears throat> the farmer's uh, uh, decision pathway during the game. And you can use the model to run the simulations and even couple with the physical model to build a more complex uh, kind of agent-based models for the scenario analysis. And uh, so now I will come with my conclusions. So during this uh, uh, talk, I show you the serious game can be used as a certain type of the policy for the awareness building then the games can also serve as a new type of the survey tools as a substitute for the traditional surveys. So you will have the interviewees uh, to be part of this uh, 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 implicit uh, surveying process by let them play in the game. Then the results can be, uh, uh, can be used to give some useful insights regarding to their behavior. And we can use some data mining approach to analyze those results. So the final remark, I want to, to quote this uh, sentence from Albert Einstein. So life is just like a game. First, you have to learn the rules of the game and then play it better than anyone else. So with that, I want to conclude my talk and I would be happy to take your questions. If you are interested in our results or the follow-up of some research, you can contact me via this email address or you can follow me on the research gate and we are currently drafting the paper regarding to this uh, uh, serious game applications. Thank you very much.